I would like to welcome um, our next speakers, Iliana and Laura. Uh, let me know if you can hear me from the University of Pompeu Fabra in Barcelona. Hello. Dan. Hello. I can, I can hear you, Laura. Welcome. Hello, Thank you everyone. very much. Thank you. Hello, hello. Uh, you're going to approach uh, the thing from a different perspective. Uh, you're going to talk to us about, uh, well, the lack of that uh, during uh, isolation, this period of time, and how we can address it by using technology and specific social robots to alleviate whatever anxiety and other um, distress might uh, the situation might have caused us. So thank you very much for joining. Uh, and please, you, uh, if you can uh share your screen whoever is going to start fantastic great thank you good afternoon thank you for this invitation and this opportunity to present our work entitled reaching out when humans can't the role of social robots as caregivers during the pandemic well in these difficult times that we are all experiencing the governments worldwide have been forced to adopt a series of measures to try to contain the spread of the coronavirus among them, the most important ones that we've been experiencing ourselves are physical distancing on the one hand, and also we've been in lockdowns, quarantines, and also patients have been isolated, etc. Even if these measures have proven effective to contain the spread of the, of the virus, they still present a series of uh, important threats and challenges especially for the healthcare sector and for mental well-being that need to be addressed. On the one hand, we see that applying physical distancing is actually not always a valid option. Let's think, for example, in, the exa in, in frontline workers, um, especially healthcare workers uh, present a high risk of getting infected, uh, which is actually very serious, uh, as we've seen in, in proof of that in some countries. On the other hand, also isolation measures, quarantines, lockdowns, they all have serious impact on mental health and psychological well-being. We are seeing examples actually in this, uh, in this conference today, and ourselves, we conducted a study in this regard to examine the impact on psychological well-being of the lockdown in Spain, which found also results supporting um, this, this finding and this line. Today, we would like to introduce social robots as a technology particularly well suited to act in this sort of situation that we are living these days. Social robots are those designed to interact with humans in their environments. They can act safely and with natural immunity in environments that have become momentarily hazardous for us. These robots can contribute to minimize many of the drawbacks of the pandemic. How? These are the most important that we would like to highlight. On the one hand, by facilitating physical distancing to minimize intra-hospital transmissions. On the other, by palliating mental health issues and promoting well-being during this health emergency. We've been analyzing how specifically these robots are being implemented in real scenarios to assist during the pandemic for this purpose. Now, I will pass the word to Ileana, who is going to explain more specifically about these findings. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, it is a pleasure to be here and have the opportunity to share our results with you. Thank you, Laura. Well, according to our research findings, we propose three strategic roles that social robots can fulfill as caregivers. So the first one in admissions and visitor areas, the second one in nursing, and the third one in mental health support. The first role is related uh, to help in hospitals and nursing homes as assistance in admissions and visitor areas, like I said before. In this category, uh, for example, social robots develop functions like patient access, um, in the patient access, we have found robot checking safety measures like mask wearing or fever detection, also enforcing safety rules, obviously according to the place that uh, where they are deployed. So I have to interrupt because I, I lost the control to pass the slides. So if, if someone can help me recover that. 
Oh, one second. Uh, maybe, uh, Merle, maybe you can hear us. Yeah, I can hear you. Um, Laura, just make sure if you press escape and make sure you're still uh, on your slides, maybe now see if you can change slides. Because you, you do have control over them. I'm not sure what happened. It's working now? That's all right. It's all right. It's working. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Go ahead again. So let's continue. So we were talking about um, these robots in admission and visitor areas that help in patient registration. That is uh, basically filling forms, making contactless uh, check-ins or check-outs for appointments, for patient appointments. Um, this in, like to avoid this human and human contact. Uh, moreover, they can collect data and link it with the medical history of the patient and book appointments as well. They are able also to do kind of like first assessment, um, like, like a pre-diagnosis assessing patient symptoms through like personalized questionnaires and thermal screenings. After this assessment is done, patients receive indications. For example, if symptoms of the disease are exhibited, um, robots redirect the patient towards medical staff, or they have the possibility to redirect them to, towards a teleconsultation. Um, this is done mainly with uh, telepresent robots. Another one is to provide general and personalized information. So these robots basically advise patients in hospitals and nursing homes um, about treatments, where to go to do a specific test, for example. They can locate areas um, autonomously and navigate patients or visitors to, to places. During the pandemic specifically, this type of robots also provides safety advice about the virus to patients and visitors delivering announcements about measures on prevention. And finally, so they can provide kind of translation services, uh, speaking in different languages and greet visitors. So these two functions are basically related uh, to improve this patient or visitor experience. So in the next slide, yeah, perfect. We can see uh, two examples of these humanoid robots, like receptionist robots, located at the entrance of hospitals. The first one is a, is a robot called Cruz from the Uptech company that is a Chinese uh, manufacturer. So this robot, for example, it speaks in, in many different languages, serving as a translator in that hospital. And like it is located in the admission area before attending an appointment, if you are a patient, you will need to scan a QR code in the, um, in the screen of the robot. Uh, this is to recognize or to check if you are wearing masks properly and also to check your body temperature. So uh, through, a, through a camera, as you can see in the image that, it, that has been adapted on the top of the robot. Uh, so uh, like this robot is able to do this kind of task autonomously, it means without human intervention. So after the assessment is done, uh, so the robot will send the patients or will allow the patients to go to their appointment or not. Uh, in the second one, uh, the second example, we find Mitra and Mitri robots. They are from an Indian company called Inventor Robotics. And even the video that you are going to see is more like a marketing video. Uh, we can see these robots in action. So they have been deployed uh, before the pandemic in banks and airports, basically in customer service activities. But in this specific case that you will see, they are adopted by an Indian hospital um, employed like doing multiple functions from screening every person entering to the hospital to print prescriptions, for example. So if we can play the video. Do you hear the sound? 
I think you haven't, uh, when sharing screens, I don't know if you clicked on the special box, so you might have to unshare screens quickly. Or I can describe a little bit what you can see in the video. As you wish. Please take a step back ah. and look into the camera. Your current body temperature is 100.8 degrees Fahrenheit. Do you have a fever, cough, throat pain, or difficulty in breathing? Yes, I'm feeling feverish. The screening is complete. Now you will need to go to flu clinic for further assistance. Hi, Sharon. I see that you have fever with high temperature. Let me connect you to the doctor. How are you today? I'm feeling feverish, doctor. Do you have any throat pain or breathlessness? No, doctor. It looks to be normal fever and not COVID. Mitri will issue the entry pass for you. Thank you. Please collect your pass and proceed through gate number two. Okay. So the second one, um, the second role that these robots, social robots as caregivers uh, can perform is nursing. So one of the most widespread uh, functions that social robots have performed during the crisis is telepresence. So these robots have normally a camera and a screen that provide the possibility to communicate patients with medical staff. So through this function, patients can interact with a doctor, for example, by video, request help about um, treatments or, or ask questions uh, to the doctor. Also, because of the severity of the disease, some of these telepresence robots have been very useful uh, to communicate patients in isolation uh, with their relatives, especially those uh, uh, isolated in nursing homes. In the course of the pandemic, some robot developers and distributors in Europe, especially um, the north of, north of Europe, uh, Asia and United States, North America, have offered their, these robots uh, without cost to hospitals and nursing homes to help in the, during the pandemic. Another function is monitoring. Uh, this function consists in, of watching patients' vitals and alert medical staff when detecting any unusual situation. So some of these robots, for example, are equipped with cameras or sensors, sensors that allow families or caregivers to um, remotely monitor the patient. These robots also can transmit um, essential information. They can take images, for example, and send it to nurse stations and collect information into the patient medical history. They can measure also uh, blood pressure, oxygen saturation. Uh, they can watch uh, the patient's routine. So they are able to do uh, or to develop different functions when monitoring patients. The last function of these, um, the, the previous function to the last is uh, patient's adherence. So it means that they are able to remind uh, to patients to take, for example, the right medication or the therapy sessions or to do a self-examination test, for example. And the last one is transporting uh, food or medications. Uh, it, it will be. It, it has been a very like popular uh, function during the pandemic, because before the pandemic, these kind of robots used to work as uh, waiters or runners in restaurants, um, normally welcoming on or welcoming guests or delivering food. But right now, they have been deployed in hospitals use uh, for delivering meals and meals and probably medication to patients as well. It is important to mention that because of the coronavirus outbreak, some robotics manufacturers added the feature of delivering things to the robots, adapting a little tray in front of the robots or, or behind to carry food, medicines, meals, documents, it's like whatever thing they need. Uh, the next in the next slide, we can see three examples of these nursing robots in action. So the first one, 
Yes, thank you. The first one is the robot James that have been very po uh, popular in uh, north of Europe. Uh, it has been famous for being used for telepresence activities with elderly people and their relatives. Um, and this company, Sora Bots, uh, offer this robot also without cost to nursing homes. The second one that we can see is a uh, is Timmy robot. It's from a, an Israeli company that is called Robot Timmy. And you see, this robot has been used in medical centers to help minimize human to human contact, mainly for telepresent activities and delivering things. And the third one is a, a very popular robot in Italy that is called Sambot. It's from a Chinese company called uh, Kihan Technology. And this robot became very popular in Italy uh, for monitoring patients' parameters. So it, it, the robot has been helping to reduce the workload of medical staff and also it has the possibility uh, to the uh, touch screen in, in its chest uh, that allow to patients to rec record messages and send them directly to the doctors, avoiding this human to human contact. So we are going to see a short video about the robot Using my abilities, medical staff can be in touch with the patients without direct contact. Risk of infection is uh, high also with uh, protection. So uh, we, we, all the staff, doctor and nurses are happy because uh, um, robots can help in avoiding the risk of infection. Absolutely. Finally, we have a third strategic role as a caregivers, as a caregiver, uh, and it's related to mental health support. So the first function that we observe um, with related to these robots is to serve as a companion, offering kind of like comfort to patients, uh, especially uh, those with visitation restrictions and physically isolated from other people. So this function uh, involves social interactions like having conversations, asking or, or answering questions. Uh, the robot can uh, say uh, motivation sentences, having physical contact with uh, the person. And also uh, some of them are able to work with patients or so to accompany patients or residents in nursing homes. So these interactions can provide like emotional support to these patients that feel lonely during uh, isolation periods. Related to the entertainment function, so we can find tasks um, like dancing or singing or playing games, especially bingo, uh, taking photos, reading news, or telling stories, telling jokes. And on the other hand, uh, they can also provide kind of uh, support uh, related to edutainment. So edutainment tasks, for example, involve more cognitive activities, uh, the type of like dictation or reading or playing memory games. So patients keep distracted and at, this, at the same time, they have been uh, entertained by the robot. Related to the well-being adherence, so we can find uh, some tasks like reminding, reminding uh, patients special familiar dates, uh, birthdays, or for example, reminding them uh, drink water, brush their teeth, uh, do exercise, and specifically like follow uh, routines. And finally, um, they also encourage patients and medical staff to follow relaxation exercises, um, yoga or workout routines or kind of dancing. Uh, some of these humanoid robots can demonstrate physically how to do the exercise, leading uh, the movement or the routine and give them, give patients or medical staff suggestions about how to do it 
or they just can project or present the video and people need to uh, follow the movement to audio instructions. So we can see two examples, uh, just to finish our presentation, of uh, robots working in mental health the next slide, yeah. So these two robots are working in the same hospital. It's a hospital in Wuhan, in China. The first one is the XR1 uh, robot from Infos Manufacturer and uh, is uh, leading uh, a dancing with patients. The second image, we found the popular robot uh, Pepper from SoftBank Company. And in these images, robots are providing physical exercise to patients in the first image and to medical staff in the second images. So from these results uh, that we mentioned before, we have concluded that social robots are developing an essential role during the pandemic. So that is why uh, we have found that there is a clear expansion in the use of these robots um, that are performing tasks or functions to address the need for distancing and physical isolation, like supporting staff. Um, as caregivers, they not only help to, pro to protect the, the health workers from infection, but also they make more effective the treatment of the patient, palliating also mental health consequences. They have also gained a lot of acceptance as social companions, especially in nursing homes, um, as limiting physical contact has been one of the best strategies uh, to minimize the spreading of the, the virus. We have identified as well that functions related or associated with uh, psychotherapy have not been experienced major adaptation during the pandemic. So probably there is a clear room for improvement in this area. And in conclusion, to finish this presentation, we need to say that these measures to contain the disease or to contain the virus have provided an unprecedented opportunity for social robots to be implemented in real uh, settings, to be implemented in society. So right now, humans are robots are working in a common front, fighting the virus. So if you are interested in our study, you can check this reference that you can see on the screen or don't hesitate to write us an email. And we, are, we are going to be more than happy to, to discuss with you our results, the results of our research. So thank you so much for your attention. Thank you very much to both of you, Laura and Liana. A very interesting perspective of how we can use uh, the technology to deal with this uh, situation, not just now, but also in the fu future. And uh, hopefully there are not gonna be similar cases, but we can see the potential. Uh, there is a question from, from the chat. Uh, Aniru Tagad says that, oh, first of all, this is very fascinating. Okay. The question is, there is a tendency when we are enamored by robots and tech to try to touch and feel them, especially in the case of children, right? And that might raise the infection risk. How do we overcome this? Um, you mean when people enter in direct contact with these robots? I believe so, and uh, Anir, correct us if, uh, if we're wrong. Uh, I think it also relates to the video that you showed before where uh, in a hospital setting, the patient might touch the robot to perform different actions, then this robot might go to a different patient. Uh, if I yeah. understood correct. <laughs> yeah, we understand that uh, robots generally perform as a link, right? Because the, the highest risk of transmission is human to human. And adding this robot in between these tasks as they are normally implemented actually is really helping to reduce this risk of transmission. And when there is direct contact with the robot, human with the robot, we understand that uh, if things are properly done, this robot is uh, disinfected before getting in touch with the next patient. There, there wouldn't be like direct um, connection, patient after patient to if things are done correctly. 
Okay, all right. And I also have a, a, a question. Um, you know, there is a different uh, concept about using uh, robots in different settings and for different uh, cultures. Of course, you know that uh, you most of all, some of them are more open to it than others. Now that we are in this situation and in cases of complete isolation, do you think that people are going to change their mind of how they perceive robots for such activities? Yeah, that's a that's actually I love this question because we've been uh, working a lot on also comparing these different uh, approaches to robots. Like for instance, traditionally in Japan, there's been like a, a better acceptance of these technologies already. And what we are um, observing at the moment is um, this fear that we have traditionally uh, felt in the Western societies towards robots we are getting the impression for the data we're collecting that because now the enemy, the common enemy is not the robot anymore. Now the common enemy is the virus and robots are actually collaborating against this enemy. And this is changing people's perception in this regard also in Western society. So we're definitely seeing like this increase in adoption and also the way that press tends to report about robots seems to be much more positive at the moment than it was maybe some years ago when the focus was more on like um, robots are gonna um, destroy humans, are gonna steal our jobs, et cetera, et cetera. Right, and this uh, this work that you've shown, like uh, the majority of these robots in these different settings, uh, which uh, countries are they coming from mostly now? This yeah, we have, actually we have uh, 195 experiences collected, and maybe Liana, do you remember exactly the number of countries because it was really high? So I don't remember exactly now. So I don't remember uh, the specific numbers, but I have to say that from these 195 experiences worldwide, so we found 36 diff more than 66 uh, different robots in 35 countries. So the majority of them uh, have been deployed uh, in China, obviously. Uh, but also uh, Japan, United States, um, France, and Belgium, and Belgium. But I have to say as well that many of uh, third world countries that probably uh, uh, before didn't invest uh, in this kind of uh, social robots, they are creating their own robots to help to fight the virus in hospitals specifically. So this is the case of uh, Nepal, Thailand, um, some countries like Senegal, uh, Vietnam, for example, uh, recently designed a robot to help uh, distributing things in hospitals. So I think there is a, like, a big, like a big acceptance now in every country and we are, recognizing the value of this kind of robots in this fight against the virus. Right, very well. Well, thank you very much again, uh, both of you. Good luck with, uh, with uh, the research. We hope to see a lot more things on this uh, domain coming up uh, soon. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, thank you so much.